the live debate. IntelligenceSquared.com There is an often quoted theory that it was bicycles which allowed the expansion of the European gene pool. A man can walk 20 miles in a day, a horse can travel 30 miles in a day, but a cyclist can comfortably manage 80 miles. So, the theory goes, instead of having to make do with a small inbred selection of potential mates from the local village, the Victorian cyclist could now go further, faster and for longer in all senses. But it's a tricky theory to test. By the end of the 19th century, railway travel was ubiquitous and there was only a brief gap, a generation span between the moment when bicycles finally became affordable mass market objects and the point in the 1920s when automobiles began to do the same. Besides, without getting too personal or too anatomical, how exactly do you quantify cycling's power as an aphrodisiac? The odd thing about bicycles is that for as long as they've existed, they have kept their contradictions, being somehow simultaneously comforting, funny, and politically radical. So when larger numbers of women started riding in the 1890s, opinion was divided between those who found it a vivid statement of emancipated modernity and those who were genuinely appalled to discover that women had legs. Sitting astride, they fretted, would lead women first to debauchery, then to nymphomania, and finally to the inexorable ruin of what one French expert called the organs of matrimonial necessity. <laughs> the rational dress movement joined up cycling, suffragism, and the fight against tight lacing through the inventions of, of bloomers. Oops, there we go. Um, Rational Dress discovers Hoopdriver, the hero of H.G. Wells's 1896 novel, The Wheels of Chance, didn't look a bit unwomanly. His heroine cycles past wearing a patent costume with button-up skirts and mounted on a diamond-framed safety with Dunlops. Hoopdriver is so entranced, he falls off his ordinary. How fine she had looked, flushed with the exertion of riding, breathing a little fast, but elastic and alive. Cycling outside in the chastening English weather might, have, might just have been considered acceptable for women, but any form of competitive cycling was too fast in all senses. At the Royal Aquarium in Westminster, already notorious for allowing women in unchaperoned, ladies' bicycle races were relegated to the status of circus acts, competing with Chinese edible dogs champion chain breakers and a group I very much want to spend more time researching called eccentric leg maniacs. <laughs> all, all four racers appeared in blouses and knickers, reported the Pall Mall Gazette of one lady's race in 1896. This exhibition must be taken in the same spirit as the show of chai chows upstairs as an eccentricity in sport. In the end, cycling was saved from an indelible connection with prostitution by ordinary common sense. Given the choice between spending 15 pounds on a per pair of Turkish silk rationals or buying the bicycle itself, most people bought the bicycle, most, most women bought the bicycle, hitched up their skirts and braved the occasional outraged stare. Bikes, like washing machines, were labor-saving devices. If they saved a woman the five-mile walk to the factory, then they were worth it. For courting couples, meanwhile, the opportunity to exchange the Sunday afternoon formality at the front parlour for an unchaperoned rural ride was irresistible. They could join local clubs and organisations such as the National Clarion Cycling Club allowed members to experience the benefits of both socialism and socialising at the same time. Just how cumbersome female dress was at the time was brought home to me when I visited Jackie Reed, a VCC member in Leeds who collects old cycling costume. She allowed me to try on a jacket and skirt from 1905, the sort of ordinary clothing most women would have worn every day. The skirt was ankle length, made of a thick, heavy, feltish weave, and had a 22-inch waist. 
The jacket had leg and mutton sleeves and was designed to be worn with both a corset and a high collared blouse underneath. With petticoats, the whole outfit would, would probably have weighed about a stone. With lead in the hems to, to keep the skirt from blowing up, it probably would have weighed double. And this was the Go Faster Sports version. The daywear version came with a train. I struggled to walk without stumbling. Cycling seemed out of the question. So, did bicycles really expand the gene pool? Are some of us here in this room because our grandparents were seduced by the flash of a diamond frame and the pong of warm tweed? Or is it the opposite, and are bicycles stealing our children? There are plenty of modern studies which seem to prove a link between cycling and male impotence, and there is plenty of evidence that saddle shape and position, and, and there is good evidence that saddle shape and position does have an effect on virility. Over the past century, the clothing may have changed, but the correlation between costume and attractiveness hasn't. I rest my case. <laughs> Perhaps in the end, the real test is not one's position on the bike, but one's position about cycling. At its root, cycling is about simplicity and joy, the rediscovery of, sh of shape and balance and the sense of self in motion. So maybe those ladies in the, of the 1890s knew something we've forgotten. They knew that the great merit of cycling is companionship. To sit bolt upright on a steel roadster or a step through and cycle together for a while is still a sure shortcut to happiness. I leave you with the example of the incomparable Zeta Hills. In 1920, following her first unsuccessful at the attempt at the channel, she cycled 15 miles down the center of the Thames with an unnamed companion on one of her patent water cycles. To do so, she wore a long skirt, a pair of heeled lace-up shoes, and to start with at least, a broad-brimmed hat. Shortly afterwards, she ran off to join Bostock and Wombworld's circus, grew strongly attached to a sea, li sea lion named Bonzo, and became one of the stunt riders on the Wall of Death, an example, I think you'll agree, to us all. <laughs>